Good morning. Buenos dias. Hey, hey, oi, oh, no, no. Did I do it? Did I do it right? Bonjour. What other ways to say it? Mm -hmm. Welcome to. What happened? <laughs> Welcome to Guiding Your Children for High School Success and Getting Into College. My name is. Jennifer Delgadillo Bevington, <laughs> who am I? <laughs> and I'm executive director of the Office of Pre-College Programs and Young Entrepreneurs at Haas, which we also sometimes call YAY. We have a great panel today who are going to talk to you about what, you need, what your student needs to know to get into college, um, what you need to do, think about financially to pay for college. Um, I'm sure that, um, oops. I'm sure that um, a number of you have been mulling over this question um, and wondering even if you should, um, should be working on a plan B if you've perhaps put off thinking about it and if, if you're not quite um, ready for your student's plan A. But I guarantee that we will go from the very general, including talking about um, colleges and universities, public and private, California and nationally, uh, um, in very broad terms. And then we'll also dive down into UC Berkeley and then also the Haas School of Business. So I direct the Center for Young Entrepreneurs at Haas, which is the, the business school's 23-year-old outreach program for middle and high school students. Is, who is familiar with YAY? Just a couple of people. So yeah, did you know we had a 23-year-old outreach program? So we teach, we um, host students, um, MBAs and um, undergraduate students and some Berkeley students work with under-resourced middle and high school students who are low income and first in family to go to college in a long-term mentoring relationship where we teach life skills, of course introduce them to business and other opportunities. Um, it's a, a fabulous program that has, as I said, been around for many years. Um, Last year, um, Erica Walker and I, my colleague who's director of the undergraduate program, and I proposed to Dean Lyons the concept for the Office of Pre-College Programs. The idea being that um, we would move YAY organizationally into the undergraduate program um, to better map the pathway to college for all students. Um, we talk a lot about the evolution of YAY, so I forgive uh, apologies to evolutionary biologists in the room or <laughs> elsewhere that I just had to put together this slide because the program has evolved over the years. Um, again, started by Ray Miles in 1989. And so the Office of Pre-College Programs is in its conceptual planning year right now. And we are working with Sarah Beckman, who is leading us through the process of problem finding, problem solving, to figure out how do we best map the pathway to college for students. Um, I like to say I didn't want to super glue yay to the undergraduate program and be done with it. And so we're taking the opportunity to really look at, um, you know, how can we best prepare students for success in, in college and beyond? And we started with that course. How many of you took Sarah Beckman's class last night? So we're familiar with Sarah Beckman's work. Fabulous, using design thinking. Um, we started with the question, how can we best prepare under-resourced youth for success in college and beyond. And at the same time we were beginning this planning this academic year, we were beginning the YAY academic year. And every year we bring in Dan Everett's and, and Gerna with Bay Area College Planners. And I was sitting listening to Dan talk to the parents of YAY students. These are parents who themselves, most of whom have not gone to college. This is a big, scary experience. And, and everything that Dan said was new to me. I went to college. My parents went to college. I have a five-year-old. And I was thinking, I'm frightened <laughs> about this. Um, and so that kind of converged with the work that Erica and I have been doing with Sarah Beckman. And we thought this Office of Pre-College Programs is much broader than, than under-resourced youth. If we design for the margins, as they say, design for the, the outer edges, it's going to benefit all. And so was born the Office of Pre-College Programs. And, and today's panel is really the first offering that we have for um, parents and families beyond YAY youth. So 
I'm going to turn it over to this great panel, um, each of whom will introduce themselves um, and talk about um, their area of expertise. What we're not going to talk about today is the um, debate about the value of a college education. So I know you've all read the articles in the New York Times and maybe even read uh, Madeline Levine's book. Um, we'll touch on it in the end. I think we're all starting from the place where we agree that there is great value in a college education. We're also not here to stoke the tiger moms in us and the, um, the, that anxiety because we believe that there is tremendous opportunity for us to do the right thing for our children. And I think that if we use the defining principles in thinking about what's right for ourselves and for our children, um, I think we'll all be winners. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Gurna. <coughs> Thanks. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gurna Benz. I'm CEO of Bay Area College Planners, and along with my business partner, he and I started this firm almost eight years ago to help families come up with a plan on what is going to be the best way to be proactive in starting a college, uh, planning a, you know, a sound fiduciary plan for college funding. Um, real quick, how many of you guys are parents of high school freshmen? Anyone? Come. Sophomores? Juniors? Seniors? No seniors, okay. Middle school? There we go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, how many of you guys have heard that I'm not going to ever qualify for financial aid because I make too much money? Everybody. We got the affluent crowd here today. That's good. So St. Joseph's University, it's all about 99% of the clientele that comes to us and then asks us to help guide their kid into the best possible colleges. Well, it's based on 50% of what we do is getting your kid into the best fit school. The other 50% is finding out, helping you figure out how to pay for it. So invariably, if you're going to live in Northern California, you know, depending on what your income is and your asset valuations, is going to exclude you from any kind of consideration for federal financial aid. This is an example for, from last year, St. Joseph's University. Uh, the dad was a captain at a local police department. The mom. Uh, was a consultant for an, uh, a, an upstart um, software company. Together, their adjusted gross income was $280,000, and they had assets over $150,000. Their daughter still received $16,000 a year in the presidential scholarship. What else we have? Uh, $4,000 in the United Scholarship Grant, the St. Thomas Grant of $1,000, um, and then they the Excellence Award of $2,500 for a total aid package of $29,000, as opposed to getting nothing at a possible CSU or a public university, in-state or out-state, I mean, she, they were eligible for financial aid. Uh, Boston University, uh, the father was a, this particular family, the father was an architect for a commercial real estate firm. His adjusted gross income, $190,000, and they had significant assets. His student, Boston University grant, 10400 still got a small housing grant, you know, uh, so financial aid eligible. And then, of course, there are going to be parents who are self-employed. Uh, this is a letter from Cornell University where the student contribution of 4315 uh, parents' contribution almost received a full ride of $47,067 to go to Cornell. It depends on every family situation is unique. Every family's income and asset valuations are unique. So you have to know that prior to applying to the respective schools to determine whether or not you're going to be need-based eligible or merit-based eligible. And merit-based eligibility is what we are focusing on. What your kids should be doing this summer. This is a slide that we normally save for summer, but we decided to keep it in because we want your kids to be active. We want them to be doing something over the freshman summer, sophomore summer, junior summer. Junior summer is the most important time of the year for them in their college planning um, as far as their resume goes because that's their final push as to what they can disclose on the respective applications that they're going to be submitting. You know, what did you do? Did you, you know, did you just play video games or did you do something productive? We had a couple of sisters that started an um, Adopt-A-Pet Foundation for senior citizens six years ago. And now uh, they are in their freshman year of college, their twin sisters, that has evolved into a full-blown nonprofit organization in Southern California. So be uh, consistent in what you do. Travel is a great way to broaden your horizons. It's a great way to see schools that you may have never, you know, thought about attending. 
you know, squeeze in a, um, you know, like a campus visit. Unpaid internships. We had a student that did two years at the Chabot Science Museum as, uh, as a freshman and sophomore at uh, Alameda Technical Institute, um, Oakland Tech, I'm sorry, Oakland Tech. And his junior summer, he became a full-blown paid intern, you know, making 15 bucks an hour. So, it, and of course, he, where did he go? He went to, um, he was a mechanical engineering student, got accepted at uh, San Diego, UC San Diego. Start a project, do volunteer work and community service. What we try and instill in parents is that there are a lot of different, you know, foundations, local organizations that can help you set up, you know, uh, volunteer opportunities. Uh, we work with helpnow.org, that's out of Walnut Creek. Otherwise, you can Google any of your local uh, area uh, community service <coughs> um, uh, programs. Take summer classes or read. It's expensive no matter where your kids go. Naturally, we know how expensive it is. This slide, we almost have to update every six months. <clears throat> um, what this slide is indicative of, let's say $20,000 would be the cost of a CSU or California State University education. Um, then if you're looking up $30,000 to $35,000 maybe, the cost of a UC, and then it can go up, sky's the limit. We, we just started receiving our financial aid award letters for this year's graduating class. Drexel University. Take a guess how much Drexel is next year. Anyone? $68,000 for one year at Drexel. You know, I mean, not to impugn the integrity of the school, it's a great school. But anyway, sky's the limit. So it depends on how many kids you have. Take into consideration the amount of uh, increase that you're going to have every single year, and then multiply that times four years. How do you apply? Anyone that wants to qualify for financial aid has to complete the free application for federal student aid. Um, a lot of parents that think that they don't qualify for it just bypass it and go, well, I'm just not going to take the time to do it. Well, will you, um, we strongly recommend that you take the time to complete the FAFSA because if you don't, you're not going to be eligible for the federal direct loans, which are the cheapest loans in the country. If you don't take advantage of it, you may not be eligible for the alumni scholarships, and if you don't take advantage of it, you may not be eligible um, for the, uh, the actual uh, local institutional scholarship. Everyone can apply. A lot of these came in with mistakes in the, in the past, but now, I mean, there, there's so much resource information that you can use that you can get them at the, you can get the form from the library, download it. You should keep doing it over and over again, and of course, do a lot of pre-planning. Uh, if your kids are going to look at attending Ivy League type schools, then you have to complete the CSS profile, which is the supplemental financial aid to the, you know, the, the original financial aid application, I'm sorry. And that'll be indicative to a lot of the uh, Ivy Leagues, West Coast Ivies such as Stanford, USC, and of course the Claremont Consortium. If your kids are going to apply to those schools, um, the application itself is like a, doing a corporate tax return. You have to, uh, if, if you're self-employed, it'll ask your student to complete a, a um, small business uh, supplement which will uh, consist of a uh, depreciation and amortization schedule of your business assets. It's going to ask you for three years worth of tax information, whereas the FAFSA only asks for one year's worth of tax information. So if you come to us and you want, and you figure out, well, I have a modest income, but I'm thinking that these properties that I own are probably going to negate any, you know, uh, need-based aid, what can I do? Well, there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, in 2005, Bush came up with the President Bush came up with the Higher Education and Tax Reconciliation Act, which means that there was something called the Small Business and Farms um, uh, Small Business Exclusion. If, for example, you have equity in properties and you wanted to shelter them, you could legally shelter them by maybe starting an LLC, as long as it adheres to the Small Business Exclusion. Now, if you came to a college planner or your financial planner and asked them to deposit those those assets into an LLC in the base income year, which is the junior year of your student's high school, it's too late. It may be too late because, once again, those Ivy Leagues or CSS schools look at three years' worth of tax information. So whereas once you had these properties on your Schedule E, now you don't, the financial aid, uh, financial aid counselor may want to know what happened to them. <coughs> I'm not going to go over this in detail uh, because uh, Geraldine here will 
We'll go over, this is just the selectivity criteria of admission statistics uh, for the UC system uh, that we started back in 07. So this is 09. You can see the hierarchy. Well, the hierarchy where UC Berkeley uh, is the most selective with UC Merced being the least uh, since it is still the start of school. 2010, um, the hierarchy remains the same. And of course, 2011. Uh, 2012 should be available over the summer. Now, um, any of you here of the ELC? Does anyone know what the ELC stands for? No? Eligibility in the local context. It's kind of like a state honors award. Geraldine might touch on that as well. Whereas if your student graduates in the top 9% of their class, they're guaranteed a possible spot at a, their favorite UC or a UC. So once again, they'll get notification of that once they complete the UC application their senior year. And they'll be notified accordingly. Thanks. So it basically says that even if a student has a perfect 4.0 GPA and a 2400, they're really not guaranteed admission into the top tier UCs, but being part of the ELC program definitely does help your chances. <coughs> by, the, by the tune of 8.2%. Okay, so what are these schools looking for? They're looking for the quality, quantity, and level of coursework uh, taken through their entire high school program. What exactly have these kids been doing? Have they been pushing themselves? If the school is offering 10 AP classes, how many of those AP classes have they taken? Uh, the strength of your courses within the context of the high school, a progressively challenging academic program including the number of and performance in AP and IB classes, sustained participation. This is key. Once again, if you're going to go into a selective school, they want to see sustained participation. What has that student done consistently? If a student has been involved in you know, a myriad of volunteer or extracurricular activities, but uh, it's not quite focused as to what they're passionate about. And they, you know, they're not going to look at it as intensely as a, if it were sustained. Intellectual curiosity, honors and or awards in recognition of academic intellectual creative achievement, sense of initiative both inside and outside the classroom. They want to make sure that the kid is worldly. What is that student doing? This, of course, is a culmination. This is the Culmination of years of financial planning and college planning. This is the award letter from UC Davis way back in 07. So the cost of attendance back then was $20,814. Um, the self-help expectation was $4,000. Parent EFC, $7,230, which total contribution is $11,230, which leaves them of a need of $9,584. So what, UC Davis has to help this family with $9,584. What they did is they offered the $3,008 worth of federal direct subsidized loan. Cal Grant met the need. That's as easy as it gets. That's what you want. That's, and then, of course, how quickly times change. Uh, three years later, almost $10,000 more. Okay? So who is eligible? Miss versus reality. Income is too high. There are three categories of family. Category one, where family's always going to qualify for financial aid based on income and asset valuations. Family two, um, family that has $150,000 worth of adjusted gross income, modest asset valuations, which may still be eligible for federal need-based monies. Category three, we just make too much money, where the only thing that you know, we can do or your financial planner may be to set up what's called a tax-favored scholarship, where we would show you how much we can save you in your taxes which would far exceed any kind of financial aid you're not going to get from that respective school anyways. Grades too low, well, we already know that it's very competitive to get, especially into the UC system, but there's still financial aid available for students that have maybe a 2.5 to 3.0. Um, they may qualify for what's called the Cal Grant B, which is the competitive award, but you're not gonna get the maximum award, you're only gonna get 50% of it. So in those cases, many times, We'll recommend you know, going to a JC and setting up what's called a transfer admission guarantee program, whereas after completing an academic curriculum, academic curriculum set up by the financial aid, I'm sorry, the, the educational counselor, you know, would guarantee you admission into a school that you're not going to be able to get into or would not, were not able to get into in the first place. Grades uh, own a home. Is that a myth? Yes and no. If you own a home and your kid is applying to a public school, your primary residence and your retirement is excluded from consideration. Primary residence and retirement is excluded. Aid is for special interest groups. It's an easy process, and of course, school people can help. Um, this is an example of you know, one of the things that you have to know. Ask questions. A gentleman came to me and said, hey, 
can you help me? Well, I said, well, what exactly is the issue? He said, well, my daughter's going to UC Santa Cruz, and um, I don't know what to do. I just quit my job, and you know, basically, uh, you know, my wife were, were relying on her 403B pension. So I said, well, let's take a look at it. I took a look at his taxes. I said, well, let's just appeal it. So this is the letter Santa Cruz gave him. The letter you submitted regarding your special circumstances and the EFC has been carefully reviewed. Unfortunately, because of the $61,000 of untaxed pensions, can't help you. Cannot help you. So we took a look at his taxes, pointed out to Santa Cruz, the money that they were referring to was a rollover. Rollover, so which is excluded. So they cannot assess it. So they made a mistake. So the letter that they responded back with is, they offered a federal Pell Grant for 1,381, a UC Santa Cruz grant for 10,194, a small UC fee grant, and some loans. So, I mean, he saved almost $16,000 per year of getting free money because he pointed out a mistake. Top 10 jobs, naturally, you know, we want your students to be employable because where are the kids going to come after they graduate college and they can't find a job? Back with mom and dad, right? So we want them to be employable. 20 worst paying college degrees, I think I got this off Wall Street Journal a couple years ago. And as you can see, some of these degrees are some of the most uh, honorable ones that you can think of. So our goal is, if you have, if your student has this passion, nurture it, but an option may be to have them go post undergrad to get a, a master's or a PhD so that they can maximize their earning potential. And then, of course, from the worst to best, what's the underlying theme here? It's math, right? Engineering. Okay. And from here, I'm going to pass it off to Dan. How to pay for it. Well, I know it's a lot of you uh, have kids that are in middle school or in the ninth grade. So we're going to address that. But this is probably a very important slide for you in that um, you know, probably I'm a parent too, Gern is a parent. I've got a recent college graduate, one down and a 12 year old. So I'm in the same boat as you. I'm worried about it just as much as you are. And even though I'm a college planner, I know a lot about how to, uh, you know, actually work in the system. It's still, we're all going to have a cost to pay for college. And being proactive is really a, a I applaud you for even being here because it, it I, we have so many families that come to us and the kids almost in the 12th grade and uh, how, much you, how much have you saved for college? Uh, about 10,000 uh, bucks. It's not really going to pay for not even one semester. Uh, how are you going to do this? So we try to give them as much uh, advice as far as that goes. But again, the earlier you start, the better. Now, many of you may have a 529, which is good. 529s are in the, the name of the student that counts against you. 5.64% in the financial aid formula. And again, if, if you, some are in the, under the myth that if your student is, you save money in your student's name, it helps. It does not. It counts against you about 20% in the financial aid formula. So again, loans borrow, we try to, the majority of our families do not have to borrow uh, maximum loans, if any, uh, because if you do this proactively and strategize how to do this, um, it can be done without loans. Assets, some people, some of our families actually use their assets to actually pay for college and, and as well as the one thing we don't want them to use is their retirement because some people say, well, I'm just going to borrow from my retirement. I was like, really? Do you realize it's gonna, you have to pay that back within five year period or you're going to be penalized by the IRS? No, I didn't know that. But again, uh, certain things that you can do, scholarships. Now, Gerna talked about some of the criteria for scholarships for your kids and, you know, mentoring your kids, we help with that, but as far as, as you get them, get them involved in a lot of different activities, so you can, as college planners, we call it a brag sheet. We're trying to build up our kids so that when that admissions officer like yourself sees that application and sees all the different things that this great kid is doing, then he may get consideration. Now, UC is pretty much need-based financial aid. There, there are some scholarships, I think, as a presidential, but a lot of the, uh, we need to, right now, because of the amount of students that are applying at the UCs, we like to have options, okay? So what if your kid doesn't get into? I think this year, we have, I think we had 40 families that applied to UC, about nine got in. And actually, we've got about four or five of our families walking around this whole uh, program today that we've, we've seen. But again, what if they don't get into a UC? You have to figure out, what are you going to do? What are the other schools? What are your options going to be? And 
that's something that a lot of people just frankly just think, I'm just going to concentrate on one or two schools and that's it. You really need to apply to probably eight to ten schools. Okay? That way, if you get a certain award from one school and you get nothing from this other school, it might be a consideration for your family. Now again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is the federal formula. Um, I'll break it down to you real easy. You're probably like the majority of families that we work with, which is generally out in the Tri-Valley. You complete the FAFSA, your expected family contribution is $20,000. To, to, to go to a school is $50,000. That's a gap of $30,000. They call it need. Some schools cover a higher percentage of that gap than others. So you need to know the numbers. Of course, as college planners, we have software that kind of gives us the, the guidelines of every school in the country. Now again, uh, this is a particular family that we work with. It's actually the San Ramon family. Kid was a great school. He was a great kid. Wanted to get into UCLA. Great high GPA, over 4.0. Didn't get into UCLA. But he got into an Ivy League school. And, and the great thing about that is if you take a look here, this is at the time, this is a few years back, this is the cost of attendance. When I say cost of attendance, I mean the overall cost to pay for college. Tuition, room and board, walk around, money, everything, except when they call you on the cell phone, which they will, okay? They're going to ask you for more money, okay? But this particular family contribution was 25 to 231. Well, that left a gap of 27,588. And the good thing about the, most of the Ivy League schools is they cover 100% of this, of the gap. So it even gets better, though, because they cover, out of the 100%, 97% of that is free money. Only 3% is in the form of self-help. So again, these numbers change. And the, the thing you know, that gives us a little bit of an advantage is that because of the software programs that we have, uh, generally, um, if this number is more than, say, the majority of schools are like 50 60%. But if a school is not at least 80%, I generally advise our families not to even apply there because, I mean, why should you get my great student if they're not going to really help? Some schools are terrible with aid. Some schools are great with aid. Cal does a good job with their aid here, um, but some other schools are not. Again, this is the scary part. If you're going to go to a private school for me, I'm worried about this. But again, um, if you're proactive about it, there are a lot of things that we can do. Going to move on. Again, I don't want to get too much into this. You can rearrange your affairs to get money by learning the legally established rules. We're college planners. We study the rules and regulations of the Department of Education. We actually have CPAs and financial planners that come to us and they want our help because we understand how this stuff works. They don't study it, they study their expertise. And again, proactive, being really active in this is great. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This basically talks about some of the services we provide. But again, I want to talk about negotiation real quick because uh, just a quick story. One of my kids, um, <clears throat> one of my kids did not get into UCLA, did not get into Berkeley, goes into a top school in San Diego, and Jimmy scored over 2,100 on the SAT. He was like a 4.1 uh, GPA and did not get into Berkeley, UCLA, his dream schools. Got into USC, they offered him no money. My dad is like the number three man in a highway patrol. They have about $300,000 in assets. But Jimmy's, other schools wanted Jimmy. Jimmy um, wanted to apply at Bennington because they had a good pre-med uh, program, and, which he did. And, but I said, Jimmy, why don't we apply over here at Tulane? They have an excellent uh, pre-med program, and they're pretty decent with money. Just apply and see what happens. Bennington offers him $65,000. Uh, Tulane offers him $90,000. Right? Big difference. Mom and dad are very happy. And so what happens? Jimmy's like, is there anything we can do? I really want to go to Bennington. I said, let's put together a negotiation letter. This school, really, you're not talking about writing you a check. It's really a discount. Jimmy does that. We send it off to Tulane, excuse me, to Bennington. Five days later, we get a letter back. Not only did they match it, they gave him an additional $5,000. So he got $95,000. But guess where Jimmy is actually going? I, I talked to the mom yesterday. She called me. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. They're going to pay $62,500 because the program at USC is, it was a last minute, last minute, uh, he got accepted at the last minute, and I'm like, okay, you know, it's your money, not mine. <laughs> if it was my kid, you would not be going to USC. Uh-uh. No. So anyway, uh, I'm almost done here. This, is, this will give you an example of some of the private schools. This is St. Mary's. It's a great school. It's right here. It's local. This is one of our clients that the uh, award was like $28,000. She got this two days later. 
She got laid off. We helped her negotiate, which is almost going through an audit to say you have to actually show that uh, you, know, you, you were laid off getting unemployment. But again, sometimes we had a really nice financial aid officer, like I'm sure you are. <laughs> and they actually increased the award uh, to $44,000, but the timing was exactly right. Uh, <clears throat> Brown, this is another one of our students that uh, the parent goes to Vietnam and teaches uh, students how to read. The kid is over there helping build homes in Vietnam. They love, mom is self-employed. Now if you're self-employed, you got a big advantage in that your numbers on your first page of, of your 1040 tax return, the number that you want to look at is line 37. That's the adjusted growth. That's the number that you use for financial aid. So that's the number that you kind of need to take a look at and you kind of will get up. If you come in, we actually do assessments for families. And because Jennifer was so nice of us for me to come in and speak to the parents of the middle school program at Yay. Uh, we have a lot of parents at Albany High that are local. Uh, and because of Jennifer, we actually put together a program to help you families with kids. It's more of a mentoring program and a program to help you financially to get your kids on the right track. So they're thinking about college and middle school. And um, it has actually been pretty successful. Now, Holy Names is a local school. We call it our ace in the hole because, you know, if your kid is going to go to a CSU, CSU, the average uh, graduation time is almost seven years. So you, this is 17 to 1 student to teacher ratio. This, you can get out of here and they have a, some excellent uh, merit money. Again, we use the school for, you know, students that really don't want to go to and stay in college for seven years. All right, everybody knows this school. Boo, University of Oregon, all right? You know, forget your green uniforms, all right, and your green helmet. Let me tell you what they did to this family. Now, this will give you an idea. They use out-of-state funding to fund their in-state students. This particular family, their, their estimated family contribution was this. They need 24601 well, they were so nice that they offered them $41,000 is what you need to pay. If you want to come here, you just get the parent loan, which is a loan that uh, is a 10-year loan with a payback. This is how you, see, you hear about families getting in debt. You have to get this loan every single year. After four years, the parents will owe over 100, oh, shoot, 100 and, 100 and close to $160,000 in that neighborhood. They'll have payments probably about $1,400 a month. So again, it's not all about the glitz and glamour, no time for the friends and family program when you're talking about which colleges our kids are going to go to. You have to do it now. UC Berkeley, great school, um, good student, and the parents, uh, parent share to go to UC Berkeley is 12003 And real quick, the kid also got into the University of Arizona. Parents' uh, cost for this kid to go to school there is free. Great, huh? Which school do you think you pick? Go Bears. <laughs> you know, it's worth it. This is a wonderful institution. So again, what we do is every family in here has a different financial background. And you don't really know your numbers if you're not familiar with this stuff. So many times what we do is, you know, we, we offer assessments for families to come in. We waive our fee because of the A in Berkeley. And you can come in for free. We have forms there for you to complete. But if you have any of these, cash, stocks, mutual funds, bonds, Equity in your home, own a rental property, insufficient, no plan to cover college costs, no idea which child you want, no idea what uh, your child wants to do for a living, no idea which major to select, no idea regarding job prospects, and if you have a chosen major, little or no desire to take on this process on your own, we can help you. Again, uh, this is an invitation for the Haas. You have the white handout here. In the back, um, there is a form that it's a survey. And if you would like to get a free assessment, we will, what you will do is complete that with your date and time information. Gern and I will be here after the uh, actual workshop, and we're also going to be over there for lunch. Complete that, give it to us. Uh, what we'll do is we'll give you a call within the next two weeks, and we'll send you some information. Come on in, and we'll see exactly where you are. And that, you really need to know that, because you don't know whether you're going to be eligible for need-based, you're going to be eligible for merit-based. You might be eligible for both. Okay, and if you're not eligible for, for need-based, you may want to point towards some merit-based schools. It depends on how, what your family, uh, uh, you know, which way you want to go with it. So uh, if you want to go ahead and complete that form in the back, give it to us, we'll be here. Um, that pretty much does it for my presentation. I want to thank you very much. And we're going to, uh, Geraldine is going to come up and do her portion. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone.
sorting. Okay. Um, my name is Geraldine Paragiri, and I was invited to speak on this panel because I'm an admissions officer for undergraduate admissions here at the university. I've been working there for the past five years, and um, one of my many roles is to evaluate and review applications. So I've read every single application you can think of. California resident, domestic non-resident, international, undergraduate freshman, and undergraduate transfer. So that's what's going to inform this presentation, and it's also somewhat inspired by the fact that we recently released freshman decisions, and I've had to talk to parents, counselors, teachers, even students as to the reasons why they were or were not admitted to the university. First thing I'm going to talk about are our freshman admissions rates. And the one thing that you want to pay attention to is the fact that as our applicant pool goes up in number, the admit rate goes down. Taking a look at years 2010 and 2011, um, the numbers are about the same, 50,000 to 53,000, and the admit rate remained around the same. There is a drastic increase between 2011 and 2012, and you do see the decrease in the admit rates. This year for 2013, we received over 67,000 applicants, and our admit rate dropped to 20.8%. And so in a pool that large, um, also the same could be said for our transfer admission rates. As the um, amount of applications have gone up, the admit rates have gone down, although it is a little less competitive for transfer applicants because you're competing against less people in the pool. Um, and the question all around when it comes to applicant pools that large, what it boils down to is the numbers game. And when I'm out in the field talking to students, parents, teachers, they always ask, what's the magic number? What GPA do I need to get admitted to UC Berkeley? What SAT score do I need? And in applicant pools that large, we're looking at, at students that are coming from different places but have very similar records and GPAs. Um, and how do we distinguish between people that, are, that have similar academic records, similar courses, um, similar SAT scores when we're reviewing applicants? And that is part of our selection process. So due to the amount of applications that we have and the fact that we have a large pool, we're very selective among all of our qualified applicants. And our selection is based on holistic review. Our holistic review process considers all act achievements, both academic and non-academic, including but not limited to GPA, test scores, honors, geographic location, accomplishment within life experiences, special programs, et cetera. And I'm about to go into these factors in more detail. The one thing that I want you to take away today when it comes to our comprehensive review is context. And um, what I mean by that is based on the context from which each applicant is coming from, Everyone has a unique experience, a unique set of life experiences based on the schools that they're coming from, the neighborhoods that they're coming from, um, their, family, their family life, and basically everything that they tell us in the application that they've experienced up until that point. Based off of everybody's individual unique experience, how is a student able to take advantage of the opportunities that were presented to them? And in reading applications and in reading teacher recommendations, that's become a catchphrase when it comes to the college application process. And we're really looking for a student that does more than just say that they've taken advantage of the opportunities that were given to them. You all are Cal alumni, so you do know that in, when you're here on campus, the typical Cal student is involved in many things, student government, maybe they're leading a community so community service organization, they're involved in internships, they're, they're trying to be at the tops of their class and maintain that GPA. Um, and what we're really looking for in our review process is someone who will be admitted to UC Berkeley and continue to do those things or contribute to that, that sort of environment. So we're looking for the type of student that's trailblazing in their community, taking the lead in projects um, and innovating. 
The first factor that we look at in our comprehensive review is academics. And taking the, it back to this idea of context, if a student is applying to us from a school that has had at least 20 applicants to us in the past, we're able to see a school profile that consists of the following things. First of which is GPA and test scores. So if a student is applying to us from, let's say, um, a school here in San Francisco, Lowell High School, we receive a lot of applications from Lowell High School. So we're able to see, based on prior, current, prior and current years, how students have done in terms of their GPA and their test scores. Now, I said earlier that a GPA or an SAT score will not make your application in the review and will not be the only factor that will cause a student to rise up in our comprehensive review process, but we are looking for students to be um, at the tops of their class or to be competitive in that respect, in respect to their schools. Um, a note about academics and context is that when we're also reviewing, we're taking a look at the student's geographic location. So California residents are going to be reviewed in terms of other California residents. Out-of-state students will be reviewed in terms of other out-of-state students. And the same can be said for international students. Back to academics at your school. Um, we're going to be looking at coursework. So based on the profiles of these schools, we're able to see how students have challenged themselves with the coursework that they've taken, advanced level courses, AP, IB, honors level. And we understand that at some schools, um, they don't have honors level or AP courses built in their, into their curriculum. And, and students that are faced with this um, will attend co local community colleges or local universities to receive that plus one point for taking an advanced course. Um, we're also looking at your senior year. Although we don't take a look at your grades, a common myth is um, with colleges that review your application, it doesn't matter what you take your senior year. That is a complete myth when it comes to UC Berkeley's review process, and I'm pretty sure the same could be said for other competitive universities. If a student is challenging themselves, their sophomore and their junior year, we're going to be expecting a student to continue that during their senior year. Um, we're also looking at grade trends. So if a student um, has inconsistent grade trend, we may be asking ourselves why. But if a student's grade trend is upward, then that's great. We understand that your ninth grade year is a year transition. So if it takes your, your kids a little bit of time to get used to, to their environments, that's fine. We're not factoring that into our GPA. We are taking a look at that for A through G requirements, um, but it's OK if, if it takes a little bit of time for your, your student to um, get, get used to their environment. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is students' involvements. Across the board, we're going to be looking at your awards and honors, the organizations that you've been involved in, community service, special programs, and employment and internships. Did you have a question? Sure. The previous slide. So you mentioned about the kid being the top of the class, uh, right? So there are high schools that have, uh, so you take one high school in one, one district where the courses are very rigorous, whereas in the other, other district, probably they're not as rigorous, but the kid is, uh, you know, top, top of the class there. And in the other school where the program is rigorous, they're very a uh, lot of competitive kids. So how do you uh, how do we evaluate that that situation? Um, that's a great question. And um, in our review process, when we're taking a look at our applicants, we are trying to, provi to provide opportunities to students um, and admit students that may not have had opportunities or have um, been given. That, that have been in environments that are, that are well resourced. And um, the things that you're speaking to in terms of advanced curriculum and the courses that are available to students at more challenging schools mm -hmm. versus, a school that, versus a student that's attending a school that may be less resourced mm -hmm. relates to um, the academic performance index. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's called API. And um, we, we do a lot of looking into 
where students are being admitted. And people, students who are attending schools that are, are more resourced are attending schools that have a higher API index versus students that are um, attending less resource, resource schools are attending schools that have a lower API index. And if you take a look at our admit rates, the, the amount of students that are getting admitted from schools with a higher API are at a 25% versus the students that are attending schools with a lower API would be at around a 12%. So students that are attending more competitive high schools are getting admitted in higher number. But what we're, what we're really trying to do here is offer opportunities to students that may have attended a school that was um, less resourced. We do. That's the other thing that we look at in our review. Thank you. So back to involvement. Um, in these areas, we're going to be looking at several things. If your kid has taken a lead role in any projects or held office, maybe founded a club or organization, encourage them to tell us about it and identify themselves. Because if they don't, there's no way for us to know in our review process. Uh, the same can be said about the level of competitiveness in their programs. We have students that are preparing to be in the Junior Olympics, that are national debate um, champions, and that are doing things at the national level. Again, we understand that with that level of commitment, it takes away from your studies, so definitely let us know about that. Within the realm of involvement, there is leadership. We're also going to be looking at leadership. So there's traditional forms of leadership, as I've, I've mentioned. Maybe your kid has um, founded a club or organization. Maybe your kid has been a leader for an organization or have taken a lead role and um, done a major project or fundraised a major amount of money for the organization that they're involved in. But there's also forms of non-traditional leadership. And some examples of that would be um, maybe they need to take care of older family members or take care of their younger brothers and sisters. Maybe they're acting as a translator in their homes. Um, Maybe they are a youth deacon at their, their local church. These are things that are embedded to, into a, a student's everyday life, and it's a part of their value system. So they may take it for granted and not view it as leadership. But it's definitely something that we view as leadership in our review process. OK, now I'm going to talk about the personal statement. Why is it so important? It's important because um, we don't do an interview process with the UC. So it's a student's one opportunity to tell us all about themselves, their passion, their drive, their motivation, everything that they've accomplished and experienced up until this point that um, will convince, convince us that they're ready to be part of Berkeley's dynamic environment and continue to do those things. And here's the kicker. They can say everything under the sun and everything in the world about themselves, and we can't interrupt them. This can be a good thing if they give us useful advice. It can be ne neutral or not so useful in our review process and not cause a student to rise up in our review if they give us not so useful advice. Students often ask, where should I start or what should I write about? The subject of the personal statement is you. So if I'm writing the personal statement, I would be writing about myself. So when I'm writing the personal statement, I want to make sure that my voice and I speak through the people and the events that I describe and not those things speaking on behalf of me. To further illustrate my point, I'm going to use our freshman prompts. The first prompt asks students to describe the world in which they come from and to tell us how um, their world has shaped their dreams and aspirations. Students will use this prompt to talk about their schools, their neighborhoods, uh, their family members. And that's great. We wouldn't want to hear about those things. Um, we wouldn't be asking this question if we didn't want to hear about those things. But um, I'm going to ask students or your kids to take it one step further. If you're going to talk about your neighborhood and how it's a great place, what have you done as a person to make your neighborhood a great place? What are the actual tangible things that you've accomplished? And um, bringing it one step further, why do you continue to do what you do? Why are you so passionate about giving back to your neighborhood? If you're going to talk about your school and how it has a value system that it's instilled into you, what have you done with the value system? Um, and what actual tangible things have you accomplished within your school's environment and why? The same can be said for our transfer prompts. The major difference between transfer admission and freshman admission, 
um, with the exception of our College of Chemistry and our College of Engineering, because for freshman applicants, we're really going to be looking for students that have challenged themselves in the coursework relating to math and science, and have also taken on co-curricular activities that indicate passion that will keep them in very challenging curriculum. Um, but with transfers, we're asking for that from our applicants across the board, regardless of your major, even if you're not applying to us from chemistry or engineering, just because you've had a couple of years to sort of figure it out in, in the college process. And we're going to be looking to see if you have those activities and you have the, the major prerequisite courses in your application. Um, a couple of more notes about the personal statement. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of some missed opportunities. My first year working in the office, there was a student that put together um, an educational fair at our high school regarding issues in Darfur. And to me, I was pretty impressed that she was doing that because I was fresh out of grad school and I just heard about what was going on. And to see somebody at the high school level um, taking initiative and actually doing something about it was great. Um, the reason why it was a missed opportunity was because she turned her essay into a history lesson about the conflict going on in Darfur. And I already knew about what was going on. What would have been more useful to me as a reviewer for her application is if she went into the process. She was able to network people that wouldn't normally be in the same space interacting about this. She was able to fundraise um, a certain amount of money for the cause. And she felt very passionate for these issues. If I were to hear about those things, it would have added more strength to her application as a whole and her personal statement. Another missed opportunity. Recently, I was talking to a very frustrated counselor because there was a student that applied to our College of Engineering here on campus, and he wasn't admitted. And he had a 4.0 GPA. He had all of the advanced math and science courses. He was the leader of his school's Greek dance team. He was the captain of his tennis team. He was the leader of his school's robotic team, and he wasn't admitted. And as I was speaking to her on the phone, I was asking myself, geez, I wonder why this guy wasn't admitted either. So I took a look at his application, and sure enough, all of that information was there. And then I read his personal statement. And um, as I went through his first personal statement, wh where he described the world in which he was coming from, what he did was he turned his essay into a smorgasbord of all the activities that he was involved in. Um, and, and briefly described what um, he had accomplished when really what he could have done was take, take the personal statement and given a lot more detail to what he's already told us in the application itself and chosen one or two out of the four things that he chose to talk about in that personal statement and expanded upon that and really um, allowed his voice to shine through and really allowed his passions and what he's dedicated himself to for the past four years to really shine through. Um, and then I, I took a look at his second personal statement, and it was really short, and I don't, in trying to recollect what he wrote about, I don't even remember what he wrote about. And um, with, our, with our applicants to the College of Engineering, because it's so competitive, um, we want to hear about your passion for the field, and he didn't even use either personal statement to talk about anything that he may have been involved in with engineering because it's obvious that he has, especially if he's been the president of his robotics team. Um, so that, that'll just show you how important it is to tell us all about yourself. There's one more slide that I had in here um, that was titled Questions, um, and it was taken out. But I wanted to end with that, not so that you can ask me all questions. But you want to make sure that when your kid is putting together their application and they're ready to apply to the top universities that whoever's reviewing their information doesn't walk away with any questions about the information that was revealed to them. And that can be said about any of the factors that we've talked about here today. Academics, involvements, life experiences, and there's plenty of opportunities for you to do that within our, personal, within our application itself. There's a personal statements, there's the additional comments box, um, for academics and whatever it is else a student wants to talk about. Um, and often at times, kids will, will say, well, if I point out something that is questionable in my application, it may show weakness in, in, on my part. And in our review process, there's nothing that a student can tell us that will harm them. 
Um, so basically what a student's doing is painting a picture of themselves based on what they've been involved in. And everything, your life experiences, your academics, your personal statement is adding to this picture that you paint, your, paint of yourself. And nothing that you tell us will harm you. Um, so as long as a student is able to show how they've grown from a situation and demonstrate that awareness, then that's great. And if uh, a student hasn't grappled with anything, or if you feel that there isn't anything that we will have questions about after reviewing your application, then that's fine too. We don't expect students to sort of struggle with every single student that we read about to struggle with something. Then go ahead and continue to tell us about how awesome and how stellar you are. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you. All right, so are we feeling uh, overwhelmed, <laughs> slightly anxious, hopefully more encouraged and informed? Um, I'm Erica Walker. I'm the executive director of the undergraduate program here at Berkeley Haas. So I work with all of the students once they get to college and they've decided that they want to pursue business as their major. Here at Berkeley Haas, um, the business program is a two-year program. So once they actually land here on campus as a freshman, they would apply to the business major. They could also apply as a transfer student coming in from a junior college. So much of this is, is down the road for, for most of you that are here. So I don't want to overwhelm you with additional information about what to do when you're thinking about major selection. But I do want to give you a few things to consider. And this is through the lens of the business major, which is slightly different than uh, some of the other majors that you might find in arts and humanities. But this will give you some things to consider in terms of how can you better support your child, your son or daughter, um, as they're thinking about what they want to do in college. And often what we hear is, you know, students think about, well, what career do I want to pursue? And based on the career, that's the major I, I should select. And that's not necessarily true. Um, now, there might be occasions where, you know, your child knows exactly what they want to do. They've been passionate about it for a long, long time, and so it's something that they want to continue. And so we encourage that. But there are other things that, you know, students are, are still trying to, to, to figure out on their own. And so there might be alternative ways in which they can still get to their particular career destination. And so we want to make sure that we keep that in mind. So some of the things, and again, this is through the lens of business uh, as a major, some of the things to consider when you're thinking about major selection or university selection, college or university, is um, what type of institution do you want to be at, right? So you want to think about, for a business major, you could actually choose a school that has a major within a professional school, like Berkeley Haas, or it could be a school that has the business major within a liberal arts college, right? And so it could be an economics major. It could be a political economies major. But it's still related to business or management. And so you want to take those things into consideration, which environment um, might make more sense for you. And um, again, it's really through that lens of, you know, in a professional school, in a professional school setting, you will be exposed to uh, students who are graduates as well, you know, graduate students. So MBA students are, are walking around here at Berkeley Haas, and our undergrads love that. Um, you know, so just to be able to see what MBAs are doing and, and potentially even interact with a PhD student under the same roof uh, tends to be very appealing for a lot of the students who choose business. Um, also consider whether or not you're interested in a four-year program or a two-year program. As I mentioned, Berkeley Haas, the undergraduate program here, is a two-year program. So that means it is specifically junior and senior year work that you're going to complete as you're pursuing the, the business major. The first two years, you're taking general education courses. Now, most institutions, and I would say across the board, you can choose any school with a business major. They're more than likely going to be academic um, academically rigorous, they're going to be just as useful in terms of you getting to your career or whatever the case may be. Um, you have to really be thoughtful about what plan makes the most sense for you as a student. So as you're working with your children, really get them to think through some of those things as well. Um, most four-year programs are similar to a two-year program in that you would take for the first two years general education courses, right? And then the last two years you're taking your upper division courses that are more specific to the major. So just think about weighing those options out. There are also three-year programs out there too for business, okay? And then lastly in terms of business, thinking about how much flexibility you have in your major, okay? 
here at Berkeley Haas. It's a general management degree, so we're going to expose you to a variety of disciplines, but you will have the opportunity to customize and tailor the courses that you're taking. So for example, if you're really interested in marketing, you will have an opportunity to take a lot of marketing electives if you'd like to. So we don't have majors within the major here. Um, you're a business major, you're going to get a degree in general management, but there may be other institutions that you go to where you know, I want to do marketing, and so that's all I want. I want a prescribed um, set of courses that I have to take. I don't really want the flexibility. I know what I want. Uh, then that's something that you would definitely take into consideration too. So again, just kind of thinking through um, beyond just the career opportunity, but really thinking about what is your academic experience going to be like uh, within that department. And I find that a lot of students don't take that into consideration. When I do presentations and I'm, I'm in, front, in front of freshman students, uh, I ask them, you know, why are you here? Why are you pursuing business? And most of them will say money. Others will say that they want to start their own business. We get a lot of students who are interested in medicine and they know they want to start their own practice. And so they'll say, oh, well, you know, I, I feel like I need to have this information. I've had other students who are very involved in dance theater all their lives and they wanted to start their own dance company. So there are a variety of reasons. But then I also get a good swell of students who say, my family made me do it. <laughs> Mom says I have to be a business major because I've got to do this. Dad says I've got to be a business major because that's the best foundation I can have. And so they don't believe it. They just know that this is the direction that they've been pointed to. And so when they apply to the major, in, in our case they have to apply, when they apply, that passion does not come out. And so we really want to encourage students to do things that they're passionate about. So maybe they're not a business major, but they're still interested in some of those concepts. There may be some things that they can take away. There are other alternatives that they can get involved in. Um, an example would be a business immersion program, which we have here. Um, and you should have a brochure in front of you. It's BASE. Uh, and that's business for art, science, and engineers. So you may be a non-business major, but you just want a quick immersion experience. And so we've got a six-week experience where you can come in, get credit for business courses, and really get the basics. And we, we try to expose you by taking you um, on field trips to companies. We have um, some of our faculty do presentations on um, different aspects of things that you might be uh, that you may need to consider if you're going into business. So there are definitely different ways in which you can pursue that. And here at Berkeley, you can actually take courses, even if you're not a business major, you can take courses here at Berkeley Haas. So, so that, that's definitely important. Um, the other thing that I always point out to students is, have you even thought about what courses you have to take in the major? Again, you're, you're so focused on career, you haven't really thought about, well, what do I have to do to get to that career? So have you even looked at the classes that you have to take? Um, for the business major, you are required to take these 10 core classes. Okay, So regardless of anything else that you take, you do have to take these 10 classes. So have you taken a moment to look at the classes, read the course descriptions, and find out what kind of instructional format um, is used often in the business school? And do you like that? Do you like working in teams? Because you're going to work in teams a lot. Do you like standing up and making presentations? Because you're going to have to do that a lot too. Do you like to write? Going to have to do that a lot in the business major, right? So thinking about what that experience will be like in the major, I think, is really important. So you know, as you support your child and in, in beginning uh, to think about what they might want to do in college, and knowing that it can change, right? We all remember. I'm a Cal alum, um, and I remember changing my major at least three times before I finally settled in on what I wanted to do. Um, and a lot of that was because of what I had preconceived as what I should be doing when I get to college, right? My, my um, worldview was pretty limited as a high school senior coming out and going into my freshman year. So I just thought that there were three different things you can do. You could be a doctor, a lawyer, or you can go into business. And that was all I was pursuing. And so you know, I, I narrowed it down myself by saying, well, I can't stand the sight of blood, so I probably shouldn't be a doctor. Okay, um, I don't think I want to do any more reading. So I don't want to pursue being a lawyer. This was my rationale as a high school student. So I figured business was left for me. And so that was the, that was the path that I followed. Um, and found out that actually there were other things that I was really interested in. And I found that through the co-curricular activities. And so that actually helped move me into a different direction where I ended up uh, pursuing the American Studies major where I was able to design it myself and it was interdisciplinary. Um, but youth development became my passion that I identified through the activities that I was involved in. So as a parent, I would encourage you to just observe 
what your child is doing? What do they seem to really be excited about? What are they really engaged in? What activities do you not have to prompt them to get up and go to? Which, which activities are they you know, kind of pulling on you and saying, well, you know, I want to go. I don't want to be late, right? Those are the things that I think you want to step back and say, OK, well, you know, let, let's try and encourage that, because I think that's really what's going to allow them to shine when they're applying to college and then once they get there. And I think that should do it. Great. As we say in uh, Yay, let's give it up for our panel. <laughs> we, have, we have time for some questions and then some. Yes, please. So I have a question for Geraldine. And that is Geraldine or Geraldine? Yes, Geraldine. Geraldine. Uh, so, how important are letters of recommendation? And is that something that's still um, taken in the application? Uh, with the UC system, unless a UC is sought you out and asked for additional information, maybe in the form of letters of recommendation, we don't ask for that with our application. Um, if it's provided, is it extra value or is, uh, is it just ignored? If students provide that, then there's no guarantee that it'll be connected to the application just because we're receiving a lot of applications and we don't have the manpower to connect. <laughs> a letter of recommendation to one out of 60,000. Um, but if that being said, if a UC does contact you and, and asks for a letter of recommendation, it is pretty important. And um, if that's something that's asked of you, you want to make sure that the person that's writing that, that letter has an awareness of the student's intellectual capability um, in combination with their skills as a leader. Um, so you want to make sure that the letter of rec is well-rounded, not just academics, not just leadership, but both. Yes, please. Also for Geraldine, do you foresee the, uh, the freshman year transfer prompts changing at any time? I know they've been there for a while, um, and you know, I mean, everybody's like, okay, they're just going to stay the same. So I mean, is, is, it, is it kind of just trying to continue, or is it? You know, I'm not sure, but you're right. From what I've heard, they've been the same for the past five years. And I haven't heard of any talks of changing them um, in the foreseeable future. So I think they'll remain the way they are for a while, but I don't know how long that'll be. Yeah, yeah I'm going to ask that question because a lot of students are encouraged to start writing their personal statements in the summer uh, before the application season in the fall. Um, so, you know, I mean, some of them are already drafting it according to the prompts that have existed. So I just you know wondering you know what you know what they can anticipate and expect um, for the for the coming fall season. So. Um. so would you encourage? I guess the question is, would you encourage that the student don't do that and wait until the prompt comes out, or I mean what? Not necessarily. I right. would even encourage a student to start writing their personal statement um, even sooner than the summer before they're getting ready to apply. Maybe not start writing it, but start thinking about how they want to frame their experience as a student as they continue along in their process, just so they can show that awareness. But with personal statements, usually the question that universities are going to be asking students relate to their academic capability, um, again, their leadership. And so universally, even if they start to write a response to one of our prompts, chances are it can apply to whatever it is that we end up changing the prompt to if that ends up happening. Great. Thanks. Others? Yes, please. I think um, it was noted that the average length for us to get a degree at, at CSE was like seven years. I was wondering, my, my question was, is that related to budget cuts in California in classes that are offered and then sometimes students just they can't take the classes that they need to because they're not offered? Because um, I heard that at one of our orientations yeah, I mean, for high exactly. school. Exactly. One of the main criteria is because um, many of the uh, classes that see CSU are, are impacted. And, you, and a lot of the schools actually publish that on their website, which is very helpful. So if you go to the Cal Poly website, for example, they'll clearly disclose what um, specific majors are impacted. And I, I know at Cal Poly, every single one was last year. San Diego State, and pretty much the same. And then, of course, how competitive the majors are. Cal Poly, very competitive with the engineering program there. But there are going to be schools such as Humboldt. And we're talking CSUs now. Um, uh, and uh, CSU Humboldt or Chico that were Long Islands for uh, uh, Channel Islands, I'm sorry, and Long Beach 
where they may not be fully impacted, maybe you know, 60, 70 percent of the majors. But if they're impacted, I mean, we have parents that are taking that uh, whose students are taking classes at the local JC because their freshman year, because uh, uh, they can't get into the classes that they require. You know, is, is this the same story with UC? That what the av meaning the average length of time is it's more than four years because of the same situation or. I think a lot of it depends on the student. I mean, we have kids that um, have graduated the CSU system in four years and the UC system in, in four years, if not less. I think that if they're aware of the situation and, and come up with a proactive plan as to how they can better themselves in getting out in and, and, and a reasonable amount of time, whether it's, you know, some parents have said, I will foot the bill for four years. After that, sure. you, know, you know, that's on you. And, the, and you know, one of the things that, uh, the strategies that a parent, that, you know, that they can employ is, is simply we've seen kids take summer school, summer school, and summer school. You know, uh, you know, taking the classes that not, may not you know fit into their social or whatever kind of calendar they have. But you know, the kids that get it know that you know what what they're up against. And this is mostly indicative of their freshman sophomore years because by the time they um, you know declare their major and are in their upper divisional courses, those courses are usually more open. Another strategy related to this that Dan has given to yay parents that seems counterintuitive is that you might be better off going to a private school rather than a CSU um, because your student will finish in four years and um, the kind of market sort of pricing and, and aid available to those students. So, and for our families, it's, it's very counterintuitive and it's very scary. And so um, that's why we start at such a young age, but, it, but it's, it's a strategy. So. Here at Berkeley, for example, and or, we have, or UC system. I, the context wasn't on the motivation of the kid and how long they could be, mm -hmm. but the nature of California schools and mm -hmm. as relates to budget cuts, because sure. it was kind of highlighted at a, a high school orientation, and they're even talking about the the consideration of the school set and those that might even be like East Coast schools or whatever, which could, you know, just be another like, consideration because of those issues that we have here in California. Yeah, well, um, I, I know that it's definitely been in the media, and I think some UCs experience it more than others. We haven't experienced it the same way here at Berkeley. Um, the majority of students who graduate, I mean, I would say on average it's about five years, maybe 5.5 years, and a lot of that has to do with students wanting to double major and triple major or minor, oh, and good. so it's student selection as to what they want to do. Students aren't necessarily ready to leave, and so they want to stay, <laughs> and so they're taking more and more classes, they want to go abroad, yeah. and so we're finding that that's what the reason is that's pulling students rather than uh, it being because they're not able to get their courses. With proper planning, okay. students are able to get their courses. They can utilize summers. Um, for our major, students are required to graduate within two years, and we have a 99.8% rate that students are doing that. So it's all about planning and making sure that they're following that path. Thanks. So we will be sticking around to answer questions. I want to be conscious of the time that we all have for lunch. A couple of reminders, housekeeping. Please complete this evaluation for us. Um, as I mentioned, the Office of Pre-College Programs, Erica and I, this is a conceptual planning year for us, and um, we want to know what you want to know and how we can serve you. So including not only topics for um, panel presentations for a reunion, but also for your students in general. Um, also, please remember to complete the Bay Area Planners um, evaluation if you'd like a free consultation. Um, and then finally, just, um, you know, what is currently available to you right now? Since there are so many middle school parents here in the room, I wanted to make sure you did notice this um, Berkeley Business Academy for Youth, which was developed by Yay Middle School Director Olive Davis, t and taking the Yay curriculum, packaging it for a two-week summer camp for students whose families can afford enrichment. This is our fifth year of offering this program. It's a wonderful program. And for the first time, we're going international. We are bringing in um, a cohort of students from Taiwan. So if your student, middle school student signs up this, this summer, they will be in a global program. It's a pilot year, um, but we're hoping to expand it um, to other regions around the world. But this is something that you can definitely take advantage of now. Um, and I just wanted to, was going to point her out earlier, but we have a, a Yay Mentor alumna in the room, Jennifer Lyons, who is also hopefully going to be teaching with us in, in this program. So um, thank you once again. Let's please thank our panelists and go Bears. Oh, yes. Sure.
Uh, yes, and the, this is this panel has been taped okay. as well. Yes, absolutely. And there's, I do have, uh, we have resources up here in addition to what was on your table.